no one disputes that the car has become civilization's transportation of choice and man's second best friend. Excuse me, sir. Can I phone you on your cell phone? Do you have any idea what it costs you to have your car? On an operating basis? Um, uh, not specifically, no. I, I know how much the car costs and uh, uh, how much I spend on maintenance and repairs and whatnot, but I really don't uh, don't break it down. Do you know what the, uh, the cost of running a car is? Uh, it's my friend's car. I see. Does he know, or is he in the passenger seat? I'll ask him. Ask him. <laughs> Whatever his mom pays. Blair Hogue, a 16-year-old high school basketball star, is about to learn the facts of auto life from his father, Gordon. The issue, does Blair know the full cost of having his own car? Basketball, school, what other things would you need it for? Go for lunch at school. Go for lunch, that's part of school. What type of car would you think makes most sense for that? Five-liter Mustang. Five-liter Mustang is a, a big V8 with, that burns all kinds of gas, that pollutes our environment more than it's polluted already, and costs a lot of money to run. You're talking about a car that's oh, okay. not just basic transportation, I don't think, to do the sure kind of th is. things that we talked about you needing to do, which were getting to your athletic events, well, to your practices. Going to the beach and stuff, though. You didn't have that on here. So, yeah, we'll write it in. So going to the beach, was that part of your recreational activity? Oh, yeah, it's a must. What do you think that would cost a month? In terms of gas. Gas and stuff? Mm -hmm. And insurance, you mean? Too? No, just gas. Just gas, gas, gas. I don't know. Don't know? 40 bucks. <laughs> I think it would be $40 a month? Sure. The insurance would probably be around 2500 to... 2500 so mm -hmm. we're saying 250 a month, perhaps. Sure. So we come up with $260 a month to operate it. That's Blair's bill. What are your personal costs? These are the average monthly costs for different sized vehicles, assuming 24,000 kilometers a year. But an author of this report says we don't realize the real costs of driving any more than Blair does. Every time you get in your car, you're imposing costs on other drivers in terms of congestion. You're imposing air pollution and noise pollution costs. You're using a road system that at the local level requires significant tax subsidies. And you're also using parking that is typically provided free to automobile users. In fact, what we can see is that car drivers are actually subsidized by the rest of us for the, the freedom and mobility that they benefit from in using their cars. 411, uh, first news. Yeah, 411. Sam Jones and Boss the Wonder Dog, they stand on guard for us. Their service is just one tiny part of the subsidy drivers receive from the public treasury costs drivers never think about, like ambulances, hospitals, fire and police services, road construction and maintenance, and air pollution. Now, is it a free ride? The visible cost of this little smash-up is a couple of thousand dollars. The cost to taxpayers is at least 50000 most of it from lost productivity from all those people jammed up behind. Add up all those invisible costs of keeping drivers on the road, and it comes to $2,600 a year per driver. Planners want the free ride to end. Okay, boss? Defenders of the car argue that the automotive industry has created a vibrant economy. And since everybody benefits, drivers should be subsidized from general revenues, now and in the future. They point out that nearly a million Canadians take home paychecks directly from the auto and fuel industries and there are hundreds of thousands of other beneficiaries in the retail business. Ted Laternus is one of the defenders. He's in love with his antique Morgan and his bicycle. I view the car or motorized transport as a fundamental freedom. I, I look at it in the same way I look at my ability to walk or run or, drive or ride a bicycle. It's, it's basic to me getting around, basic to my freedom. And you can't take that away from me, I won't let you. I think the automobile has an important part to play in a comprehensive and coordinated transportation system. And I think it's time the planners began to think more of including the automobile in that plan rather than attempting to tax or beat the motorist from behind the wheel. If we're required to pay more for driving on our roads, highways, and bridges, then we have to decide how we want the government to put its hand into our pockets. But we're illustrating one method of payment here today with a group of residents of a tiny cul-de-sac. They're cooperating with us 
but they don't know everything. Our man in the bucket is Rahmat Ali. Ali, take it away. Ali is a field technician with Mark IV Industries of Toronto, installing the latest vehicle identification technology to try out another way of paying for road and related services. The drivers living here in White Rock near the U.S. border don't know they'll be getting an invoice at the end of our one-week test. Today I'm going to be installing a transponder on your vehicle as part of the demonstration. All right. Ali's company makes roadside readers and transponders for toll collection in the state of New York, and they'll be installing a system like it in Ontario next year. Many governments are adopting the principle of user pay to offset the indirect costs of driving. Cars passing by the reader will be identified and the time of the trip will be logged. The technology will permit an automatic toll payment for travel on different roads. Invoice, you be the judge. Your the week is up and track. residents get their bills. You have made 22 trips from the Thrift Street the past week, five in peak periods and 17 in non-peak traffic periods. Many of the indirect or social costs of driving your car are not covered by fuel taxes or motor vehicle licenses. Under such a system, your total charge is $28.80 for your one week of driving. This translates to $124.80 per month, or $1,496.97.60 per year. It's a big bill. Um, I think we spend an awful lot on our one vehicle every year as it stands with, uh, you know, really high ICBC premiums, um, all the taxes, I guess, that are implemented into, into gas prices, vehicle maintenance and everything else. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I might uh, come back a little, pull back a little, right. walk, walk, a walk little up more. to the store instead yeah. of taking yeah. the car up there. It's not that far. $400 a year, what do you think of that? Well, that's that's a lot of money, but it may be worth it. Yeah? It may be worth it. Yeah, that's a lot of trips, and it's such a short period of time. Yeah. yeah. You were busy this week. <laughs> I must have been. <laughs> the defense proposes an increase in the gas tax, which is an existing user pay system, to recover the driving subsidy. The gas tax has to my mind, a simplicity and a certain appeal that just increasing it a little bit, it requires no extra cost to increase the tax a little bit. Well, I have for none of them. <laughs> none of those. <laughs> a wise man. But the, uh, if there's a mess, uh, I, see, I, I will see the user charge. The user charge? Yeah. Uh, I don't like road tolls. They're kind of uh, a nuisance. <laughs> I just say covered in the tax, I guess, is fuel tax. Would you? Yeah. Why do you say that? Because then the people that are using the vehicles will mostly be paying their the major share. But now you be the judge. Our first of four telepoll questions deals with how we should pay for the extra services for our cars. The prosecution says every driver is being subsidized on average $2,600 a year. They say a user pay system will force us to choose cheaper, environment-friendly alternatives. They say a charge on roads rather than on fuel is the most effective. The defense says the car is part of a transportation system which benefits all society, whether people drive or not, and thus the indirect costs should come out of general taxation. If a user pay system is adopted, a fuel tax is easiest. If you believe we should pay a fee or road toll based on use, call 1-900-273-1112. If you believe we should pay through an increase in the fuel tax, call 1-900-273-1113. If you believe we should pay as we do now through general tax increases, call 1-900-273-1114. A beep registers your vote. There will be a 75 cent charge. Do our cars take up too much space? Next. Too hard. I want to illustrate, oh, it's heavy want to illustrate how much space the car takes up in a single-family home. Typically, a garage can take up to twice the amount of space of a living room, and it takes up the best space in the house. It faces right onto the street where you can watch children play, and your neighbors can get to know your neighbors, and instead, we have our cars and have the garage doors. And you don't get to know your neighbor, you get to know their car. But high-rise buildings are also designed around our cars. 
In a 30-story condo, the car gets fully 25% of the available space. It represents about five football fields or about a thousand living rooms. So uh, you un at that point, you can start understanding how much space the car takes up. And it's a spatial pig. And as per expected, we've got about a 10-minute delay to get onto the bridge deck. From it's the a spatial pig out here, too. Cars and other vehicles eat up more than 40% of the downtown real estate in Canada, but the problem is getting them there. We've taken a registered nurse to one of the worst traffic tangles in the Vancouver area. We're with CTV. I'm a nurse. Could I take your pulse and ask you about stress and driving? Um, yes. Okay. Then we have this arm. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. We're finding many drivers have a slightly elevated heartbeat. Your pulse is just a little bit high. Are you finding it stressful driving today? Yeah, it is. How do you cope with, dri with the stress while you're driving? I just listen to music, just try to relax, you know, not get too bent out of shape about it. I've already been hit a couple of times, just driving straight in my, in my own lane, and they move right over. Stoppage like this, it's a little worse. Going ahead, stopping, going ahead, especially if you want to get somewhere. What I do is I just kind of put my mind in neutral on the way home, pay attention to the road. Mm -hmm. That's about it. And just keep on driving. Yep. Okay, are you headed home now? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Am I average? Am I alive? You are. Your pulse is maybe just a little bit fast. How, how do you uh, find driving this time of the evening? Oh, yeah, it's uh, dangerous out here on the street. Right now there's a logging truck that's spilled over. Some guy's in the hospital. But it goes on and on and on and on. We need more roads. Yes, we could certainly build more roads, we could certainly build more bridges, but the answer seems to be, if you build them, they will come, they will continue to drive, and the cost to society are starting to be such that many people are saying, we simply can't afford it. The family car is becoming the personal car. More and more people are driving alone and taking up more space on the road. Governments are trying to reverse the trend. This is a highway with privileges for high-occupancy vehicles. The packed lane is filled with SOVs, single-occupant vehicles, at least two out of three in an average rush hour. The empty lane is reserved for buses and other vehicles carrying three or more people. For the odd SOV who loses patience, the RCMP have a special reward, a $75 ticket. We've had a number of different humorous stories that have happened uh, on this freeway from people inquiring about using mannequins to uh, a person attempting to count his dog as one of the occupants in the vehicle. Uh, they're a good idea, I think, for the, uh, the buses and the cars with more than two. And you wish you had three, right? I wish I had a dummy in the back. <laughs> Want to hop in? <laughs> and it's quite possible, as the full costs of car travel become known, that driving a single occupancy vehicle may actually become as socially undesirable as smoking is now. What are you going to do? Are you going to implement a law saying you can't drive your car unless there's four people in it? What are you going to do? Go down to the local mall and pick up people and put them in the back of the car so you've got your complement of four people or three people? It's not fair. I mean, if I want to drive my car by myself uh, and you want me to get out of it, you're going to have your work cut out for you because if I want to drive it, I'm going to drive it. SOVs inspired a wealthy Fraser Valley peat farmer to create a van pool, making him a kind of commuting folk hero. I'm no hero, I'm just an ordinary guy who happens to have some money and decided to give it away instead of taking it to the grave with me. But Jack Bell was so frustrated by SOVs, he put up $300,000 of his money and arranged a $2 million loan to create a fleet of 87 air-friendly vehicles. It takes nearly 600 people to work and back and keeps over 500 vehicles off the road every working day. Planners say this is the future of urban transit, smaller vehicles taking you closer to your destination. Some of Canada's largest public and private employers are now adopting carpooling programs. Some cities are considering supporting carpooling by restricting access to downtown areas. And that's an idea Jack Bell believes won't cost the public treasury a loony. We've proposed, and other people have suggested too, that we put a cordon around the city. And during weekdays or business days, single operated vehicles pay a toll to get in in the morning, between say 6 and 11 or whatever maybe two dollars every vehicle. MOVs, multiple occupied vehicles, go for free. We spend nearly 200 million dollars a year in Canada, as Joni Mitchell would say, paving paradise by putting up parking lots. But should parking have privileges? We're at a downtown Vancouver parking lot, and our attendant is our researcher, James Strand. James, what's your assignment? 
Well, this morning, Jack, we're going to be uh, identifying those SOVs, and we're going to be explaining to them, because they are a single occupant vehicle, they're going to be asked to park at the very top of the parking lot, as opposed to if they had more than one person in the vehicle, they would be allowed to park in the lower portion of the car, uh, car park. Um, I was to tell you you were an SOV. Did you know what that meant? Yeah, I don't know. Should I punch you in the face? <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, I was a double occupant until about uh, 60 seconds ago. I, oh, dro dro I dropped my wife off. I mean, the problem is we really don't have a community anymore in the city, and so it's hard to get people together in one vehicle, right? That's right. Yeah, the city is not a community city. It's very singular. You've got two people in the car, so this is good stuff, because we'll get you to park in the lower section. If you only had one person, we'd have you park all the way up to the very, very top for environmental purposes. Excellent idea. Excellent idea? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Predictably, most SOVs weren't really thrilled with the idea, but a surprising number of them understood the reason for it, and they accepted it. That's great. Go so, top floor? No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're pulling my leg. I haven't had my clap yet. <laughs> That's great. Now you be the judge. Our second of four telepoll questions deals with the principle of special privileges for cars that carry more than one person. The prosecution contends that SOVs should be treated like smokers and that special road and parking privileges should be provided for high occupancy vehicles in the same way that non-smokers receive special consideration in public and workplaces. The defense contends that driving is a basic freedom. Since all drivers pay equally for the privilege of using roads and parking lots, they should also have equal and unrestricted access. If you believe cars carrying more than one person should get preferential treatment on highways and in parking lots, call 1-900-273-1115. If you believe there should be unrestricted highway and parking access, call 1-900-273-1116. Your vote will be registered by a beep. There will be a 75 cent charge. Coming up, our soup of the day. In BC, it must. All right, just need your registration, please. This is air care, a compulsory emission test for all BC cars, and it's said to have reduced Vancouver area pollution by some 20%. Mind you, heavy trucks and buses aren't tested at all, and some of the worst polluters are given waivers because repairs would be too costly. But it's the only system of its kind in Canada, and later we'll take it one step beyond. Our cars pollute on a grand scale. My car represents the average car. Even though it has emission control equipment, It'll pump out 300 grams of pollutants after just one kilometer on the road. Of course, it's a few years old, and older cars pollute much more than new cars. Okay. But watch how much collects in this balloon while the engine runs at driving speed of 2,000 RPM. Smog is that yellowish pall that hangs over a city in hot, sunny weather. Technically, it's ground-level ozone nitrogen oxide particles suspended in the stagnant air. In Vancouver, in the Windsor-Quebec corridor, and in the southern Atlantic region, summer smog often exceeds acceptable levels. Cars are polluting a lot less today than they did even just 10 years ago, and they're getting better all the time. And with the advent of alternative fuels, I suggest to you that we're gonna lick the pollution problem in our lifetime. But these technological fixes are not going to solve the whole problem. Since population is growing and people are driving their cars more than ever, all of these technological benefits are in fact being offset. Cars are not the number one air polluter in the world. You know what the number one polluter of the atmosphere is in the world? Cows and livestock. The, according to the World Health Organization, flatulent cows are contributing more pollutants to the atmosphere than automobiles. Cows are a problem in pollution, there's no question about it, but cars are something that we can control. We don't yet have a way to control the digestive systems of cows. Well, thank goodness cows don't drive, because auto flatulence today in the lower mainland is bad enough. It could fill 47 BC Place stadiums in a day. Half of one of them would contain deadly pollutants, and five would be filled to bursting with carbon dioxide, the gas that's changing our climate. We live in a fragile cocoon of air around the Earth, and it's not as deep as you think. You'd reach its outer edge if you pointed your car straight up and drove at highway speed for only 10 minutes. 
our unconscious tampering with the energy levels in the cocoon has been linked by some scientists to the dramatic weather behavior the world has experienced recently. This year alone, there have been an unusual number of heat waves in Canada and hurricanes in the South Atlantic. CO2 increases heat energy. That produces higher temperatures, and that in turn changes our climate. About 31% of the CO2 trapped inside our cocoon comes from motor vehicles. The climatic change phenomenon is very recent. In just 50 years, it's estimated the world's average temperature will be two degrees centigrade higher. That's not much, but it's enough to increase water levels in many of the world's oceans by from three inches to two feet, causing major flooding. But our immediate crisis is here on the road. This is a kind of frontline assault vehicle in the war against smog. Its mechanical nose sniffs the air near busy roads, and when the pollution reaches a dangerous level, a smog alert is declared. Three have been issued for the Vancouver area so far this year. Even rural residents are warned to stay inactive and inside, especially if they suffer from heart or lung problems. The air quality reports on the television or in the paper, they're usually too late for me. I usually know before that whether or not the air is good for me that day just by breathing. Like tens of thousands of other sensitive Canadians, Kerry Priestley is like the canary in a mine shaft, a human early warning system in this world's double blind experiment with the air we breathe. A University of BC study estimates that more than 80 Vancouverites will die prematurely every year from smog. Across Canada, that death toll could be in the hundreds. So I'm just gonna have you take this right now okay. and just pin it on up somewhere near, near your breathing zone. So, and you can With the direction of Dr. Michael Brower, we're placing ground level ozone monitors on three healthy people to see how smog affects where you live and where you work. We've had very little success in this country in dealing with this almost invisible smog problem. Unless there's an alert, most of us don't know we're under attack. Helen Gambling is a mother and realtor who spends her day taxiing family and clients to and from houses. We chose a public works laborer, George Noga, to represent people who spend all their working hours outside. Our volunteers will wear the smogometers for four days, 12 hours a day. Sylvia Bands is a municipal accountant who, like most Canadians, spends her entire working day inside, even at lunch. Predictably, the lab told us the laborer had the highest reading because he works outside. But we were surprised to discover that he was exposed to 20 times more ozone than the accountant and about four times more ozone than the real estate saleswoman. And that could have long-term consequences. The plants that share our airspace are suffering as well. Take the monitors and we'll go uh, exchange them. Thanks. Agriculture Canada researchers have devised a new socially redeeming use for tobacco. It'll help farmers decide what crops are safe from smog. And we're using a uh, ozone sensitive tobacco plant. It's a show and tell plant. It indicates the uh, ozone injury uh, by these specks. The ozone penetrates into the leaf and uh, undergoes a series of reactions inside the leaf and the net result is that some of the cells die. Crop loss from smog can be as much as 18% in the Fraser Valley, which has the most valuable farmland in all of Canada. A few Canadians are addressing the smog problem by switching from fossil fuels to cleaner alternatives, like natural gas, propane, ethanol, or methanol. But less than 3% of the car population is running on mixes or alternate fuels, which is not nearly enough to beat the automobile baby boom. We're still hooked on the power and speed delivered by gasoline and the internal combustion engine. The auto industry spends millions on high performance in events like this because that's what wins the day. But only about 1 20th of the power of an average engine is needed for city driving. The electric car just doesn't seem to exude the same sex appeal as this noiseless rally demonstrates. California wants 10% of all cars to have zero emission eight years from now. But batteries for electric vehicles are still bulky and pricey. Individual deal, two batteries at once, uh, three guys on each side dragging those batteries out. A Vancouver company is experimenting with hydrogen fuel cells, but it'll be several years before they're small enough for your car. 
the tailpipe emits water. The big automakers believe the answer now is hybrids, battery and gas power combined, like this blueprint Beetle. A Canadian group has come up with a different hybrid. A gas generator charges the battery, turning the tables on traditional power configurations. But it's only on paper. Let's be realistic here. If you're going to implement this kind of technology, make sure you can do it first. Don't start saying, you can't do that anymore, because if it, if it doesn't work and you can't do it, what's the point of even talking about it? When we put the car in its proper place as just one transportation option among many, then we'll have reduced pollution, reduced congestion, and freer mobility for people who choose alternative forms of transportation. Technology alone won't solve our pollution problems. It'll take personal initiative as well. We've come back to the air care center to road test an idea. Project, we're, we're labeling people who have passed the air care and some who have failed by putting a small sticker on the back of your bumper. You passed, so you get a green one. Green is a passing grade. Yellow is borderline and red is failure. Cigarette packages and cans of chemicals have warning labels, so why not cars? This van was a borderline pass and the driver accepted the label, admitting he needed a tune-up. Motor vehicles are the source of approximately 75% of the pollution problem in the Vancouver area. Manufacturing plants, refineries, and mills have to apply for air permits and are rated according to their emissions. So there's precedent for what we're doing. Uh-oh, is this really bad news? Barely, it just barely went over the limit there. Look at that. Now, we're going to put a red sticker on your bumper, and you have to keep it there. Identify your car as having failed the air care until you come back, and it's replaced by a green sticker. Well, All right. right? I can do that. I can do that. You're okay with that? <laughs> we were pleasantly surprised to find that even those who failed gave the idea of labeling cars moderate to enthusiastic support. So it doesn't embarrass you to have a sticker on the back? Oh, it might if I had, like, a nice car, but I know this one's pretty bad. Tailgating is not recommended. Now, you be the judge. Our third of four telepoll questions deals with the principle of visible identification of the polluting capacity of every vehicle on the road. The prosecution believes vehicle identification would act as an incentive for drivers to maintain their cars, and it would also provide a warning. The defense supports an air care program but believes vehicle identification might infringe on a driver's civil rights. If you believe vehicles should be visibly identified, call 1-900-273-1117. If you believe vehicles should not be visibly identified, call 1-900-273-1118. A beep will register your vote. There will be a 75 cent charge. What are the alternatives? Is there a better way? Amigos, estamos perdidos. Não esquenta. Eu peço o mapa pelo correio eletrônico. Aqui? Eu tô rodando o S2 Warp Connect da IBM. Ele me dá acesso remoto ao servidor da minha rede. Ao meu work group, até a internet. Será que a internet tem uma lista de aranhas venenosas daquelas bem peludas, grandes, com a cabecinha de dor? I'm here to see what's new at Whippletree General Store. The Whippletree General Store is the only place to shop on Vancouver Island for the largest selection of quality wicker and rattan furnishings. The General Store also has a great variety of interesting gift ideas. And now they have a linen section for napkins, tablecloths, and bed linens. There's always something new at Whippletree General Store, but don't just take my word for it. Come in and see for yourself. Whippletree General Store, just south of Duncan, on the Trans-Canada Highway. Someday, one of these beasts may rule the roads. Inventors will go to extraordinary lengths, even using voice activation to solve our transportation problems. Now, it's one thing to be aware of a problem, but quite another to do something about it. We invited the chief executive officers of the 25 largest corporations in BC to give up their cars for a week. We asked them to set an example, if only for the public relations benefit. Now, can you guess what happened? Only one was available, and he was already commuting to work by bus. 
Do we need any more proof that we're physically and psychologically dependent on our cars? It's an addiction. Would a busy family living in suburbia sacrifice a car for a week? Well, we found a family in West Vancouver with two cars, two drivers, one of them a commuter. We arranged a family discussion and then popped the question. I'd like to know whether you'd be prepared to give up one of your cars for a week. That would be interesting. No car. <laughs> no car. <laughs> no car. No no <laughs> I think they've come to a standstill. <laughs> All right. That'd be a little hard for me to go to and from the office. I could bust. It's, it's great to be able to say, yeah, you could give up on the car for a week, but in the end, there are circumstances when you do need a car. Could you reorganize your life uh, without a car, with all these commitments to the kids, to driving them to their various I think activities? What would well, I think what would happen is you'd have to cut back on the activities. Really? Um, you'd have to make that sacrifice well, I think, without the car. I think in some cases, yes. Lindsay's ballet is not easy to get to on the bus. And it means a and time constraint. And isn't? No, that's right. You can't get up to karate easily. So it's, I think it would be a time constraint. We're all on this time machine that keeps going and going and going. And it goes faster and faster. And we seem to, uh, you know, need the vehicle. There's a buffet of alternatives to the car. The first option, stay home. The question has been raised, why would you use a 4,000-pound vehicle to transport a 2-pound brain? Telecommuters like Brian Williams, a geotechnologist, don't have to. He can teleconference. Okay, I'll call you on the other uh, on the other program. Working at home can substantially cut down your wardrobe costs, save space, minimize interruptions, and reduce time on the road. Employers and unions are bickering over implementation, but they agree with the logic. Why don't we move the work to the person? And that's really what this opportunity creates. And. You know, I think that if you had enough people that were teleworking, that you would start to see some impact on the roads. Another option, mass transit. It's still considered second-class travel in this country, but it's first-class efficiency. One full bus will remove about 45 vehicles from the road. Subway and sky trains will take away hundreds. Ironically, though many people say they'll use transit more, there's been virtually no recent increase in ridership. The reason? Annually in BC, government expenditures on public transit totals $360 million, but compare that to the $2.3 billion in subsidies for private motor vehicles. There are other options that don't require any funding at all. And how about a school bus without tires? Get the kids to pick up. Oh, great. Which way are we going? We're going this way. And we've got to pick up Brittany first. Okay. This group of retirees has volunteered to introduce you to the walking school bus. Instead of seats on a chassis, this scheme provides loops on a rope. Bye, Joe. It's an idea originated in Australia to reduce car travel, increase safety, lessen the load on parents, improve fitness for two generations, and stimulate social interaction. Most of the schools you'll see, you know, 50 or 60 cars around there, and each one of them has taken one kid to school, you know, and uh, they could cut down a lot on the pollution, plus all the traffic on the road, which would be good, you know, for everything, actually. What do you guys like about it? That we're walking. Is that we want to get some exercise. It's not enough to just tinker with our current transportation system. We have to think about what kind of communities we want. Right now, our communities are automobile dependent. We've designed our communities to meet the needs of cars. We have to start thinking about meeting the needs of people. That means more green space. That means being able to walk to stores, to schools. Cars and environmentalists are not mutually exclusive. You can like cars and still be an environmentalist. I'm an environmentalist. I have a canoe. I like to hike. I love the outdoors, and I get out on my bike whenever I can. I still love cars. doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to trash the environment. They, are, they, they, they can coexist. Things we can all do drive and maintain our cars better and buy air-friendly cars in the first place. Sure. Anything in particular, new, used, something in between? Something free? Something, in between. something free? Yeah. <laughs> Advice. <laughs> it's only worth what you pay for it. <laughs> Meet super salesman Al Sedgwick. Al, I'm looking for an environmentally friendly car. Now, what should I buy? Jack, to be eco-friendly, what you should really be looking for is, is the smallest car possible you can get by a whip. Coupled with the least number of cylinders in the fuel-injected engine a five-speed transmission, and radial tires. That's what you should look for in the vehicle. And then there's the things not to look for. You should not have a roof rack. You should not have a sunroof. 
anything that, that lessens the drag coefficient of the automobile creates drag, giving you less fuel economies. Stay away from power windows and stay away from air conditioning. That's the killer. Now that's what I should buy, but what do most people want? People ask for the biggest gas guzzling power performance automobile that you can get your hands on. <laughs> Hold it tight in your hand and then just bring it towards you and just let the oil just drop straight Ooh, down. There it is. You got that out. Okay. I'm learning how to maintain my car, and my teacher, thank you, is Bernie Pollock, mechanic. Changing the oil and the air filter could give me a 10% fuel saving. I should have a minor tune-up every six months. Check the tire pressure. Tire drag can increase fuel consumption by up to 8%. Regular maintenance can reduce pollution from your car by up to 90%. Now, if you insist on buying and driving a gas guzzler, you've got to learn how to reduce the amount of guzzle. First, if you pull away gradually instead of Formula One fashion, you'll use half as much fuel. Drive at the speed limit and in off-peak hours, and drive where there are fewest stops. Minimize the air conditioning, Combine your errands, and turn off the engine if you're waiting more than a minute. The ultimate fuel efficiency? Use mass transit or ride share. Tash, we're home. Let's go. We've shown you all the problems, and you've passed judgment on various solutions. You've also seen all the transportation alternatives available. So our final telepole question is your personal pledge. Choose one of these four options. Call the number beside your pledge and leave your name and address. You'll receive an AutoSmart guide that will tell you how you can more than earn back your telepole charges. The first 3,000 callers will also receive a keychain. Will you maintain your car and drive it more fuel efficiently? Walk or bike more? Take more mass transit. Start carpooling. In a moment, the first results from our telepole. Water runs right through this environment. Sheila, I agree. Individual action is essential to limiting emissions. We hope this show will encourage you to think about how your car is being used. Be auto smart. Together, we can make a difference. We thank you for passing judgment. Please be assured that when the final results are compiled from across the country, they'll be placed into the hands of government officials and industry CEOs. Well, hopefully we've all learned from this program. I confess that when we launched our research, I had no idea I was getting a $2,600 free ride from general tax revenues. I didn't think about the fact that when I drive alone, I'm imposing on everybody else's space. I wasn't aware that every time I start my car, I produce a balloon full of gas, and that every kilometer I drive produces a pound of pollutants. Well, I heard messages like that about smoking, and eventually, like many Canadians, I quit. I can't quit driving, but I can cut down. I'm Jack McGaw. Good night. This program was produced with the research and financial assistance of Environment Canada and Natural Resources Canada. All right, that's a strike. Okay, let's go. Here we go. <laughs> Video copies of this program may be purchased for $24.95 plus $4 shipping and handling. Visa and MasterCards accepted. Call 1-800-728-2488. That's 1-800-728-2488.